The Ohio primary ballot shakeup. Who's in, who's out, and who's switching? Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Kathy Kandiski, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Ann Fisher, host of All Sides with Ann Fisher on 897 NPR News. Mike Gonadakis, Republican strategist, and Sam Gresham of Common Cause Ohio. With the candidate filing deadline less than three weeks away, the two top 2018 races remain in a state of flux. First to the U.S. Senate race. Sherrod Brown, no drama there for that Democrat. The only question is, how much money is he going to raise? But on the Republican side, with Josh Mandel's departure, Congressman Jim Renacci has changed races. He leaves the governor's race to face businessman Mike Gibbons in the primary, and it may become even more crowded where it is that J.D. Vance, hillbilly elegy author, who now has a house in Columbus, is seriously considering a run. Prominent Republicans want him to. Mike Gonadakis, first to Jim Renacci. Does he have a better chance against Sherrod Brown than Josh Mandel did? Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, Josh, personal friend of mine, um, but, you know, he carried with it some, some baggage from previous races. And I, th I think Jim, um, with the experience he's had, his time in Congress, I think it's the right tone and tenor to take on Sherrod Brown. The great thing is, is all the oppo research has been done against Sherrod Brown and Jim Renacci. So what we have left to deal with is the issue. So does Ohio want someone that cut in the mold of Hillary Clinton and her policies or Donald Trump and his policies? Because that's pretty much how stark the contrast is between both candidates. It's going to be a great race. You don't mind running against... Donald Trump, I would assume, from the from the left, from the Democratic side. Well, Mike, Mike made a, a statement of the platforms as the approach. I think it would be tragic to use uh, Trump as your prototype and support. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to that. I think Sherrod Brown is going to be difficult for any Republican, whether you're in the race early or late. He's going to take it to you, uh, and I think he's going to win. I think he's a prominent presidential candidate, possibly. And his name has been mentioned, so he needs to trounce the senatorial candidate that he goes against. Well, one thing we know is that both these candidates are going to be really well funded. I mean, I expect a lot of money to be pouring into Ohio into this race. And Sherrod Brown's got a lot of money already on that. Renacci, I, I, I'm not as familiar with his funding, but I expect that he's he's going to match him dollar for dollar. He's personally wealthy and he's willing to spend on his own campaign as well. Right. Five million dollars he said he's going to punch into it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think you can call it a great race or not. I think it's going to be a really, I don't know, dirty might not be the right word. It's going to be a harsh race. There could be very a lot of harsh rhetoric. <clears throat> it may be a race that people are tired, get tired of hearing about uh, in, in the final analysis if Renacci wins. Is it going to be a referendum on Trump, though, you think? Mm, it could be. Yeah, it could be. Mike Gibbons, he's there. He's, mm -hmm. he's well-funded. He's, he's offering to put in another $5 million to his campaign, Mike. The, he's an outsider, more of an outsider mm -hmm. than Renacci is. Could he make some waves? I, I, no disrespect to Mr. Gibbons. I don't know him. I've never met him. But um, I, I think that there'll be enough pressure on him to get him to bow out. At the party's going to coalesce around the ORP will. Donald Trump already has around Renacci. We don't need to spend $1 on a primary. Democrats would say the same thing on their side. So what we need to have is a head-to-head -head with Sherrod Brown and Jim and they say, look, Donald Trump won Ohio, beat Hillary Clinton. So obviously there's a gravitational pull to those policies and beliefs that he has. And here, here, run on here are the numbers, Mike. 57, I haven't seen Ohio numbers in a while, but 57% of the Americans in the Quinnipiac poll released this week say that Trump is unfit to serve. Not that they don't like the job he's doing, that he's unfit. Six in, nearly six in 10 Americans. Ohioans have to be kind of in that mix somewhere. Doesn't that pull a drag on Renacci and all Republicans running? Nope. Um, you know, the, the the narrative in 2016 was is Donald Trump's going to topple our entire ticket, Rob Portman's going to lose, we're going to get wiped out. The exact opposite happened. So we're, we're, I'm, I'm not questioning Quinnipiac. It's the gold standard. I get it. But at the end of the day, the silent majority will show up and will continue to vote for yeah, candidates but, like well, Donald Trump. He won because there were counties in the rural area that overperformed. Mike has an interesting point, and I want to see this. Are they still enthusiastic after a year of this man and the types of things that he's done, how he's embarrassed this country, the foolish things that he's done, and continues to do? I think people made a mistake when they voted for him in the first place, and, and I think they have buyer's remorse. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, if Renee, Renee is certainly embracing the Trump dom, you know, he was uh, t just today was defending his comments about you know immigration, so I mean he's embraced Trump. We'll see if people still support Trump. It'll be good news for him. If not, he may have trouble. That's right. J D Vance and Fisher. He's been there's a draft J D Vance effort out there. Rob Portman kind of 
you know, lightly endorsed him, saying, we, I think he's seriously considering it, which is kind of like... <coughs> it's a typical Portman. Uh, yeah, right? Mitch McConnell apparently wants him to run. Do you think he, do you think he jumps in, J.D. Vance? Uh, I think that he's going to get a taste of what it might happen if he does jump in, and that is going to be scrutiny. And uh, he hasn't had that yet. He's an author. He's a really well-known author, and he's very highly regarded in many circles. There's, as you said, a draft <coughs> J.D. movement. But uh, uh, he's already being questioned for his uh, where where his residency is, whether it's in Washington D.C. where his wife works and they do own property, and uh, he had a homestead exemption uh, on that property uh, versus uh, the location here in the Central Ohio area. But, but he did his walk and talk interview with Megyn Kelly in German Village. Does that mean he? Well, it's nice it? optics, no question about it. <laughs> and I would imagine he's got some pretty. <laughs> he's in a German Village is a very pretty place, but. Okay. He he yeah, has people working with him. He has with a home him. there. Yeah, he, he does own a home there. In all fairness, he does own a home there, but he's also got people who are, he's got professionals working for him now who know how to run a campaign and right. have been setting him up, and, and well, he should. I just wonder now that Renacy's in the race, I mean, does he, I mean, does he stand a chance? It's interesting, some people are trying to draft us back to the point, you know, J.D. Vance did not support Trump and has right. been open about that. So it makes you wonder who's, who's exactly recruiting him. In fact, he was against Trump. Yes. Well, let me ask you this, Mike. From a purely future, looking down the road perspective, the, the saying is you have to run statewide once in Ohio and lose before you can win. Right. This seems like this would be a low-risk J.D. Vance campaign. He runs, he either loses to Renacy or he loses to Brown. He runs a positive campaign, gets his name out there, builds a campaign operation for down the road. Might that be a consideration? Uh, I, I subscribe to that theory you said, but if you get slaughtered in a race, you're, there's no way to come back. And J.D. Vance would never survive a Republican primary because of his position against the current president, our Republican president, and the fact that he hasn't done anything. Great author, great young man, but you got to do a few things before you're going to run for the top prize like the United States Senate. And um, he, sh he should run for something down ticket, run for state rep, run for Senate, do something. But right now, if he puts his hat in the ring, it's going to be an epic failure for him. I don't get that. I mean, what did Donald Trump ever do before he ran for president? Hey, ran successful multi-billion dollar business. So he what says, but I haven't seen the proof for that. I, I'd like okay. to see his tax sure. uh, returns sure. on that. Sure. I'd like to <laughs> see no, that, not. too. Multi-billionaire. Speaking of no political experience, Jim Tressel. Seriously? He's going to run for Senate? He's running a big university. Yeah, sort of big. Kind of big? Universe? Well, whatever. <laughs> Decent size. I want to be respectful. Decent size. Okay. Uh, I don't I don't think that's a good idea. He's 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 got his foot in the water talking about running for Senate. People want him to run. That's what the reporting is. Uh, it goes along with that whole I don't know, that whole thing about having a celebrity or something, I guess. Yeah. He was always very senatorial. Yeah. The <laughs> he would never answer a question. Never answer a question. He had the sweater, too. I yeah. don't think he'd ever use a vulgarity, either. Right. You'd ask him if the sun was going to rise in the east, and he would say, it's going to compete. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to have a good game plan. If it doesn't turn the ball over, it's got a chance. <laughs> but if you asked him about tattoos, what would happen? Oh. Uh, he passed it, he passed it out to Gene Smith. <laughs> Let's get to our next topic. The governor's race is shaking out a little, of course, on the Republican side with Renacy's switch. It's now just Mike DeWan and Mary Taylor. Taylor named her running mate this week. And as we know, John Houston is Mike DeWine's partner. The Democrat slate is more complicated. There's a new candidate, a candidate has left, and one has switched races. The big story is that Betty Sutton has ended her bid in order to become Richard Cordray's running mate. Two big names joining forces there. Then a day later, Dayton Mayor Nan Whaley announced she has left the race and is endorsing Cordray. So just as the field narrow, it grew. Former Congressman Dennis Kucinich announced he'll join the race. So to update your scorecards, it's Cordray, Kucinich, Bill O'Neill, Connie Pillich, and Joe Schiavone. Kathy Kandiski, first to Mary Taylor. She stuck to her guns. She stayed in the race. Now right. she has the anti-establishment lane, so-called, right. to herself, even though she's been lieutenant governor for eight years, was auditor for four years, and a right. state rep for four years before that. Right. She's so, the outsider. Does she have a chance? Uh, I think it's going to be tough for Mary Taylor against DeWine and Houston. I think she's going to have a tough time raising money. Uh, and I think there's also this factor that a lot of people who oppose the current governor, Governor Kasich, Mary served as his lieutenant governor, and as much as she's tried to keep some space between the two of them, I think a lot of Republicans still connect her with the Kasich administration. So I think for those reasons, she's got kind of a tough, tough road to, to go. You probably would be surprised at what I say, but uh, for the top ticket for a woman in the Republican Party uh, in Ohio, I think it's a difficult tread because of their history with regards to the women in major positions. 
And I just don't see her getting through the mark. I don't see the support coming for her. She can do all she can. But Betty Montgomery, she, she won statewide. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Joanne Davidson, well-respected in the Republican Party. But, but that wasn't the governor. That's a different type of race. Are you saying I think, Nancy I think they're ready. I, yes, I'm For saying in the Republican Party in Ohio, a woman still has a, tip, a difficult time. Yeah, that's not Sam. Don't say that. Yes, it is. It's, it's the, the truth. First, first you want me to give you the house, a history? Joanne Davidson, a Republican. First um, Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor, a Republican. Okay. First African American uh, State Treasurer Ken Blackwell. Okay, a Republican. So we can, you know, I can debunk all these things about women don't have a chance. You don't have the, the leader of our party, the Ohio Republican, the Republican Party, Republican? is a woman. Where's okay. The you guys have. You're all male dominated. Or governor. You're, you're, the Democrats are all male dominated. Where you keep saying me now. Get your. That's right. You're an independent. Get I take that back. Straight. I take it back. Right. You're an independent. Um, women have had a difficult time at the higher levels in the Republican Party. Come on now. You can play this game all you want. You can chart it out. But when they get in there, the Republican Party tends to eat them up. Well, wait, maybe what we might be able to say is Mary Taylor may not be the right woman for the governor's job. I mean, right, she may not it. be the right woman. I mean, I don't think she's really distinguished herself a lot as lieutenant governor. Uh, mm -hmm. pr you know, privately, people question her work ethic. Um, I hear a lot of things like that about her, so she may just not be the right woman for the job. I do feel there's a sense of voters across on both parties that they're they're anxious to to see more women in politics. I this agree. this will be the year for the women, whether or not it's on the Republican side or the Democratic side. I think we'll see more. So along those lines, Ann Fisher, Betty Sutton joining with Richard Cordray was kind of expected, um, mm -hmm. not a huge surprise, but it, those that, is that the Mike DeWine, John Husted comparison for the Democrats? Well, you've got two insiders. You've got two people who have a lot of uh, chops, political chops. And, and you've also got a couple, you know, I mean, particularly when it comes to uh, Cordray, you know, policy chops. He's got a, really some very strong uh, places that he's coming from. And so does Betty Sutton. She's got a strong record. She served in the Ohio General Assembly as well. So, yeah, I think that that would be sort of that balanced, uh, more balanced ticket. The question is, um, you know, I mean, there isn't, a, as far as uh, DeWine and Husted go, it's two white males. Mike, Republicans are still aiming almost all of their emails and attacks on Richard Cordray. They obviously mm -hmm. think he's the person, the man to beat. That ticket is the t ticket to beat. Uh, how, how worried are they about those two candidates? Um, I don't think ultimately worried. Richard Cordray's been gone for quite a long time in Ohio, what, seven some years. He's got to reintroduce himself. Look, I say this, Richard Cordray is a very decent person, decent man, decent husband, father, but he's a boring politician. He's like Jeb Bush, okay? Jeb Bush ran just because. I'm Jeb Rob Bush, Portman, he had all the money. Excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> so where I'm going, give me a chance. <laughs> so at the end of the day, if Dennis Kucinich picks a, a Nina Turner, let's say, hypothetically, that ticket will <laughs> easily beat Rich Cordray and Betty Sutton because that's what the young people, that's what the millennials want. They want pizzazz on the Democrat side. And that that would beat Rich Cordray well, and Betty is, Sutton. The question is, who is going to appeal to the base? It's not Rich voters, Cordray. Young voters, who's going to appeal to the base? Who's going to get people out to the polls? Who's going to bring women and younger voters out to the polls? Because that's where, you know, that's where... You know, I think Sutton's pretty are. strong on the campaign trail. I, I think she's good on the stump. I, I, I think you forget last time around. They lost the uh, Strickland and Cordray, but they lost by a very slim margin, the one or two percent. A loss is a loss, and the place that they lost the best was Cuyahoga County. So if they can get Cuyahoga County straight, I I, I don't find Rich as the most polished, but I think he's going to be better than what you think this time. What now, is Betty Kucinich is good on the stump. Betty Sutton is good on the stump. If Kucinich he really kind of, to me, upsets the apple cart the most in the, mm -hmm. on the Democratic if side. He picks because, Nina, watch out. You know, what happens in Cuyahoga County? He, you know, people in the Cleveland area love Dennis Kucinich. Yep. Yeah, favorite but I, don't, underdog. I don't think the rest of the state takes him seriously. But I know, but Cuyahoga County is so Democratic rich, you have to do well up there. Well, I think I think Betty Sutton probably brings some balance to that. You know, she's from Summit County. I think she brings some balance in right. Northeast Ohio. She lost to Jim Manese, though, so she's got a lot of strength. Yeah, you're talking, we're not talking general. We're talking just the primary. I'm talking the primary, so you yeah. have to see who, who basically who Back to the issue of boring. Out. We've yeah. had a lot of boring governors. I'm just saying. I'm not going to name names. Successful boring governors. Really good boring governors. <laughs> Well, now, Jerry Springer is the only exciting candidate. We've got that a long time ago. That's what we wanted, Jerry. We want to do there for 30 seconds. <laughs> is he out, out? Yes, I believe okay. he is. Uh, for now. Anyway, this week, Republicans in the state legislature unveiled a plan to redraw Ohio's congressional districts in an effort to end partisan gerrymandering. The proposal would require support from three-fifths of the legislature, so a kind of supermajority, and in there, at least one third of the minority party, now Democrats, has to agree before a new map is used for the next 10 years. 
It would cut out the governor from this process and eliminate voter referendums to reject bad maps. Democrats and redistricting reform advocates say the plan will make the system worse. The General Assembly must approve this proposal by early February to get it on the ballot. Sam Gresham, you are one of those mm -hmm. advocates for reform of redistricting. What do you think of that plan? I will refer to Roosevelt. You have nothing to fear but fear itself. This whole thing is concocted out of fear of the proposal that we've been working on for two years. Uh, it, it is out of fear and the success that we had in the 2015 election where 71 percent of the people in the state supported our agenda. We won in 88 states, won in all 88 counties. We won every time. So this is created out of fear because if we get the congressional district, and we are going to win the congressional district because it's simple. It's fair districts, fair election. That's our slogan. Now. The other part that bothers me about their proposal, there's no transparency. And then they talk about splitting the, uh, the counties. They talk about splitting the cities. Oh, this is convoluted at best. Mike, is this a good plan? It's, it's a better plan than what we currently have, okay? Let's face it, Ted Strickland in 2009, 2007, he could have put a proposal together and he said no because they thought they were going to get reelected. So what the Republicans have done is said, okay, the system's broken, let's fix it. They put a proposal out, of course Sam's group's going to criticize it because it's different than theirs. But what this does for the first time ever is requires minority voting in order for it to be approved. That's a huge leap forward. Is it perfect? No. Name a piece of legislation that's ever passed and signed by the governor that is perfect. It's not, nothing. It's a rule. this is a better step forward and they need to, they got some work to do on it still, but it will, that will, the, whatever the Republicans come, with, come up with will be the final say on this. And but the way the legislature stands right now, it does require minority voting, one-third. Um, but the, they're in such a small minority, you only need about three people. Three right. people. Win you know, some elections. It's hard to do with yeah, the issue. It's hard to do with just, it's a vicious cycle at this point, and uh, it also cu it cuts out the governor. Um, it, uh, which could make a big difference if, if you know, if, if then the more likely chance that there's a Democratic governor elected right. before the Democrats take over the Ohio General Assembly. So I think that's another twist to it. Um, so far, from what I understand, uh, you know, the group that's pushing to get it on the ballot next November, they're not going to stop. So right. the question then remains, yeah, the, the Republicans can push anything through that they want in the Ohio General Assembly, but what's going to take precedence, what they enact in the General Assembly or what goes on the ballot and what the voters approve in November? Number. Sam, when you talk about the, how the, the, those is one third of the minorities or the minority party has to be there, it seems like, I haven't read this anywhere, I haven't heard this, but it seems like it's maybe aimed at the Legislative Black Caucus, which it tends is, to be Democratic. Directly. Because they really want to have districts like Joyce Babies and the Marsha Fudges up in Cleveland mm -hmm. that represent minorities in Congress. Is that what the aim is? Well, Am I reading too much? And that are guaranteed. It's a, it's a deal, it's a side deal that hasn't been made to sweeten the pot for the black uh, members of the, uh, of the General Assembly. But the problem with that is Fudge and Joyce's district could afford an opportunity for another African American to win. The way those districts are constructed, packed and cracked with black folk and Democrats, yeah, you're going to win, but there's a possibility if you split those districts up, you could get another African American. Make them more competitive. I mean, yes. that's the problem. I mean, none of the congressional districts are competitive no. in Ohio. That's the problem. Mike, does the ultimate solution to this, we've been talking about this for 215 <laughs> years, 16 years, <laughs> since Governor Jerry first did it back in Massachusetts. Does the ultimate solution rest with the courts? And there is a case pending right now. There's two cases pending. Well, they've been consolidated in the United States Supreme Court. I think that's going to give great guidance, although we can't force them to hurry up and make a decision so we can get our stuff taken care of in 2018. So what we put forward and pass, or Sam passes, might ultimately have to be changed based on what the court says. So, you know, there is an argument that's valid that says, well, we should maybe pause and wait to see what the United States Supreme Court says, because they have the last say, no matter what. They will have the last you, say in this. You know, the stupidity in this is that we've been working on this for 11, 12, 13 years. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the Republicans, out of fear, thinking we're going to win and watching us have won in 2015, come up with a piece of legislation. That's poppycock. Is there room, Sam, you're working with Common Cause, also mm -hmm. legal women voters. There's still a few weeks left. Is there room to get an agreement before the filing deadline for that May ballot? So you, you don't have to go to either ballot or go to I, I one. Think, and you I think the way they've right. structured their proposal, they're so far away from us that I, I don't know how you negotiate something like that. I don't know how you come close to what. The General Assembly is going to draw the map. We want a, 
a, a group to do it. We want transparency. Y'all want to be in the back room and come That's up with a deal. Right there. So yeah. politically, yeah. how hard yeah. will it be? Say, right. say voters approve this plan in May. How hard is it going to be for you in November to say that plan wasn't good enough to vote for ours? It's easy. It's very easy because <laughs> I've said it, I've said it here today. Their plan, it, Genesis, is fear, not a good plan for the uh, voters. We've come up with a good plan for the voters. They're scared of us, so they concoct something to try and win. All right. You'll see how it plays out. The U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments this week on how Ohio maintains its voter rolls. Here's how it works: registered voters who do not vote for two years are sent notices by mail. If you don't respond or if you don't vote for another four years, your voter registration is canceled. Secretary of State John Houston says the system protects the integrity of the rolls. Opponents say it's unnecessary and suppresses the vote. A key opponent is former Army Sergeant Joseph Helley, now mayor of Oak Harbor. His registration was canceled while he was serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. After the Supreme Court hearing this week, he confronted Secretary of State John Houston. I never received any such notice because I was an active duty soldier that maintained my home of record Absol in the absolutely. state of Ohio. We, we came we back home after defending that right and could not exercise it because of this archaic, terrible policy. All you have to do is use your right to vote. From a mountainside, sir. While we driving- email you, we, email your, we email you your ballot. Look, we want to help in any way we can. We have an online system. In the time that we're having this conversation, you could literally pull out your smartphone and register to vote. And Fisher, any idea how, it's tough to read into questions that justices ask, but any idea how the Supreme Court views this case? Well, it's generally agreed that the Supreme Court's probably going to side with the state. Um, Justice Kennedy is usually the swing vote, and from what people could determine from his questioning and, and that kind of a thing, and his, his you know, uh, history, uh, he's probably going to side with the state. So uh, that's that. <clears throat> I mean, um, you know, it, it uh, it's it's not an issue that's going to go away, though. I don't think. I mean, it, it'll be resolved on one level, but it won't be resolved on other many others. There's still there's there's other issues involved. Uh, even Stephen Breyer, the liberal justice, seemed skeptical or seemed to be on. Con it's he hard seemed to tell. Comfortable. Sometimes. He yeah. seemed comfortable with it. It was only Justice Sotomayor that I think uh, is the one that, that was questioning it a lot. And, and the, the fundamental question is: You can have a right to buy a gun, and they never take that right away. Why are they taking your right to vote away? I think another fundamental question is, as he said, you know, you, you ha all you have to do is exercise your right to vote. But in the United States, another equal right is the right not to vote. And you have to register to vote in order to vote because that's how we do our bookkeeping on all of this. But the right not to vote is partly what's being violated here. And, uh, and having to be forced to vote in order to maintain your right to vote is... Um, is, is, is a problem, and it does affect certain groups inordinately, particularly minorities and poorer people. But I think this is a characteristic also of the Republican Party. Uh, Mike, you'll have to take this way today. You tried, that party tries to purge the list, put systems in place that oppress vote because they're afraid to get people out to vote. They don't think that people are going to vote for them. Right. So the, the only problem with Sam's argument is nobody agrees with it because they tried voter suppression arguments in 2010. It failed 2014. Now here we go in 2018. Again, at the end of the day, you don't, you're not forced to vote if you want to keep your name. All you have to do is log in and say, yep, I live here. But I may not have a login. I may not have a computer. Uh, okay. Why should I have to do well, that? Okay. Every public well, library that in, in the yeah. state of Ohio has free computers you can use. You can pick up the phone and call See, the Secretary of State's office. Bottom line, the Supreme Court's going to uphold this. It's as being constitutional, it's easy to vote and hard to cheat. But that doesn't make it Ohio, right. And that's a good thing. It doesn't make it right. The Supreme Court will vote. You it. have to do that with your gun permit. That's you right. You have to call every two years or four years. To you don't say, have to I do that with your gun permit. Or I've taken a retraining, whatever, whatever requirement. Well, you're asking the wrong guy because I don't own a gun. I know, but so, I don't know anything it's about it's guns. It's a, a constitutional public right. issue. It's a constitutional issue. I don't own a gun. I can't. I am the least last person to speak on the issue of guns. Well, but my, I, do, I don't I'll remember one. that. <laughs> do, <laughs> but, 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 I don't own the principle one. is it's a freedom that's expressed and it's not denied over a period of time whether you exercise it or not. Do you drive? Of course I drive. Do you have a driver's license? Wow, here we go. I'm, I'm getting cross-examined. Yeah, well, you do, I mean, you're, you do have to renew this, your, this you kind of have ridiculous to license. You do have to re years. renew your yeah, license, but that's, right. a, that's not a right. It's a privilege to it's drive. It's hard to get away from the argument that these types of restrictions disenfranchise certain right. voters. Yeah. So the more restrictions you have, and it's hard to get away from the argument that Republicans are the ones that tend to put these restrictions in place, 
and that they more often impact Democrats. I mean, it's hard to get away from all the, this argument. Whether it's right or not, we'll see what the Supreme Court says. All right, let's get to our final off-the-record parting shots. Sam, you're up first. I think the Supreme Court is going to surprise you. It's going to say it's, it's unconstitutional with regard to purging in Ohio. Mike. Uh, 189, Mike, 189 car crashes in the past six months on 270 between Dublin and Hilliard, and ODOT refuses to address this issue. They need to sit down seriously and figure out what this problem is or more lives are at stake. And I've got kids that travel on this. We've got buses on that road. They need to fix this immediately. It is a mess over there. I'll give you there. Anne. Uh, as far as the redistricting issue goes, um, you know, you mentioned they're talking about it 215 years ago and we still haven't solved the problem. But I really believe, and I've been saying this for a long time, I think voters are finally figuring out what the issue is. They finally understand, and I think that's why they, in 2015, they made the, that choice, and I think they'll do it again in 2018 if they have a chance. Kathy. Well, I can't go without saying that ECOT, the state's largest online school, looks like they're going to be closing next week because there are ongoing financial problems. Now attention on this moves to the state, particularly the Department of Education and some of Ohio's bigger school districts, to see what exactly they're going to do to bring these kids back into schools. Okay. For the most part, immigration reform and enforcement has targeted undocumented immigrants. But this week, 7-Eleven came under the fire of ICE and the Trump administration, <laughs> raiding many stores around the country. Could be the first of a new crackdown on companies that employ undocumented workers. If it is, look for immigration reform to happen in the Congress if companies start losing workers and getting fined. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. Continue the discussion on Facebook, on Twitter, and at our website, wosu.org, where you can get every episode on demand. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.